recording the proceedings now. Go ahead. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the webinar organized by SDH Institute, Vital Singapore MBA student. I would like to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Eric Saar, the owner operator of Dulles for the Ship Hotel, the first ship hotel in South Asia, located in Binton Island, Indonesia. Together with Mr. Daryl Saar, CEO of Santa Fe Technic Group, we will keep the webinar within one hour schedule as an hour in respect to the participants our schedule. So we encourage everyone to post your questions on the chat board for the moderator to pick them up during the webinar. A recall version of the webinar will be sent to your email also. So without further delay, I would love to give the stage to Mr. Darrell. Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning good and morning. thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us so early at 10 a.m. I know it's early for some and a bit late for some others. So we're going to discuss today about my dad's project. If you notice, uh, there are two saws in this group here, uh, which is a very rare surname. So it's me and my dad. Uh, I was called upon by SDH to moderate this uh, webinar, which means I have a series of 16 questions. These 16 questions are not uh, created by myself, but they were actually created in discussion with the MBA students of SDH. And I will be posing these 16 questions to my dad. Okay, um, so... Where is, what screen is everyone seeing, uh, Lindsay? Uh, it's the first screen. The first screen. So, okay, yes. the, the, title. the picture of the ship, that's what everyone is looking at now, is it? Yes, the title. Okay, sure. All right, so. So, Darrow. Yes. Just be kind to me. Don't ask too, too difficult questions. <laughs> All right. It's, it's not my call. It is the questions that were created by SDH. <laughs> Okay, so uh, then maybe you can take some time to introduce yourself to everyone first. Okay, hi. My name is Eric Saw, and um, I'm 69 years young this year. And um, this project of Dulos Foster Ship Hotel is actually uh, a calling for me. I feel it's a calling and I, I put a lot of effort my passion is in this project now, and I'm so glad that uh, Dr. Fred and his team has uh, invited me to come and share some of my thoughts on, on the project, especially in such difficult times when the COVID-19 uh, is uh, so rampant all throughout the world. Yeah? But uh, I hope you will not expect too much wisdom from me. I'm pretty new. Uh, in the hotel industry, uh, but I, whatever I have my two cents worth, I will gladly share very openly. Yeah, I guess that's about it. Daryl is my son, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. So in this, uh, in this webinar, we'll be covering the concept of Dulos Force. For those who are not so familiar with the project, uh, Eric will be sharing about the concept of his ship hotel. Uh, we'll also be discussing the crisis, the recent COVID-19 crisis and how it's affected our business. And finally, we're going to talk something about marketing, uh, which means how are we going to progress from this point forward. Uh, you can see three themes that will be running through the discussion. Uh, number one is to minimize damage. Okay, if, you, if you're taking notes, you can uh, write that down. Minimize damage. Okay, number two is to salvage revenue. Whatever little revenue is left, he's trying to salvage as much as he can. And number three, the exciting part is to get the best position for market recovery. So these three themes, themes will be running through the entire discussion. And as we pose the questions, I challenge you guys to identify how Eric's answers uh, fits into either of these three themes. All right, so without further ado, let's talk about the hotel itself. Question number one. What unique experience would you like to bring to your customers and attract them to visit your ship? Wow, okay. That's a good first question. Um, I guess I would need to give a very qualified kind of answer to this question because um, you asked what unique experience would we like to uh, give uh, to our guests. I believe that uniqueness is very temporal, yeah? 
Uh, yes, today our project, our Dulos Foster Ship Hotel might be extremely unique, especially in this part of the world. But who knows what tomorrow holds? Yeah, uh, somebody may come with something even more unique, something more, even more special, and our uniqueness will be lost in the wayside. I would suggest that uh, rather than just uniqueness, I would, we would be focusing on the 105-year-old history of this vessel. Yes, she was launched in 1914, just two years after the Titanic, yeah, the ill-fated Titanic. So she has a very rich and illustrious history behind her. And um, I guess, you know, but to answer your question, uh, the uniqueness, yeah, um, you know, as a ship that was built uh, more than a century ago, her deck plates are curved, you know, there's a con convex curvature. So as you walk, you find that uh, the center of the ship is higher, the port and starboard is lower. So you, you never forget that you are on a ship. That is very unique. You go to any hotel, you get flat uh, floors all over, yeah? So the curvature of the deck plates is one thing. And if you look out the potholes, um, you'll find that many people still feel that there's a sensation of movement as though she was still floating in the water. I guess that's a, a, a kind of a illusion because as you look out the pothole, you do see the sea and you do see the ripples in the water, etc., etc. So that is kind of unique, yeah? And um, yeah, we also, when we check somebody in, we do not say, oh, uh, we're going to put you in this room. We say we're going to put you in this particular cabin because we are a ship. So we have got people who ask us, hey, uh, by the way, Eric, um, how many rooms do you have in your hotel? And I surprise them by saying, I'm sorry, we do not have any rooms at all. So their jaws drop and, and, and I smiled at them and say, yeah, but we have a hundred and four cabins and then they laugh with me yeah so these are some of the unique uh, features uh, you know and um, as i mentioned just now potholes we don't say look out the window and you can see the sunset or the sunrise i say look out the pothole so all these uh, little experiences the the lingo that we use give uh, people a sense of uniqueness yeah yeah but again as i said uh, it is maybe temporal the second or third trip you yourself will probably refer to our windows as potholes already yeah and maybe one one other important thing that uh, may be a bit more unique to our hotel is that our staff eventually and we do not call them staff by the way is a slip of my tongue yeah <laughs> we call them crew our crew eventually will have naval style uniforms not the typical coat, jacket, tie kind of thing of, of uh, typical hotels, but they will have naval uniforms showing the different levels, the hierarchy in, uh, in our management. Things like that, yeah? I hope that answers the question. Okay, interesting, because I hear two things from you actually. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all is the unique experience, which was what we asked. Uh, the unique experience of giving the customers or the guests an experience of staying on board a cruise ship. So the ship experience is a unique experience, but we're also talking about a unique selling point. So we are differentiating unique experience from unique selling point. Mm -hmm. The unique selling point actually is the history and the heritage of the ship, and that is something that cannot be replaced. Yes. Yeah, I also... It's her history her. and her own history, and nobody can take that away from her. Mm. Yes. Okay, another unique feature about this project is your vision and your mission. Would you like to share a bit, a bit more about those? Oh, yes, uh, but I'll need to do the short version because if we do this, we'll be here till after lunch, yeah? <laughs> yeah. In any way, yeah, uh, our vision here, this, this came to me uh, more than 30 years ago, actually. Uh, I had this feeling that I should set up a profit-oriented company and donate its entire 100% of its profits to what we call good works which is charity uh, in a nutshell, yeah? So, uh, but I had to wait 30 long years uh, because we didn't have enough funds and we didn't have the right project, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, but um, I am basically a trainer at heart. 
And uh, to kind of explain my vision, I came up with a, a term, a very wise sounding term, if you like, and I call it the externalization of the internalization. So a few friends uh, would, would tell me that, Eric, uh, this externalization of the internalization is as Greek to them as is the name Dulos Phos. Incidentally, Dulos Phos means servants and light in Greek. Yeah. So one day, uh, the moderator that you are looking, you are lis listening to now, Daryl, my son, came to me and he said that externalization of the internalization might be a little bit too deep, too philosophical, if you like. And he gave me a phrase which kind of encapsulates this uh, vision very well. And he said, externalization of the internalization simply means using what has been placed in our hands to achieve what has been placed in our hearts. Wow, and I thought that was fantastic, yeah? So using what has been placed in our hands to achieve what has been placed in our hearts is really, uh, in a nutshell, what uh, our vision and our mission stands for, yeah? Uh, our proceeds will go towards charitable good works, whether it be education, it be whatsoever. But I think um, one of my pet uh, projects, a uh, kind of burden that's in, been in my heart, is to dig, help to dig wells in India because you know many Indian villages do not have clean water, and we have the women folk suffering. The, we have young children, you know, dying because of contaminated water and all that. It is very very sad. So whenever we can, if when we do have the funds, this would probably be one of my first few projects, helping to construct wells in India. Yeah, that's the short, short version. And perhaps uh, at this juncture, uh, Lindsay, if you can, uh, I, I believe you have already done a kind of a short PowerPoint presentation. Perhaps we can show this to our, our viewers, the guests in, in this seminar. All right, uh, the first one is the history. As I told you just now, uh, the, this ship was launched in 1914, first as SS Medina, a freighter. Then she became a pilgrim vessel uh, SS Roma and then she became again another passenger ship where she was converted to become a first class passenger ship MS Francasi and I guess perhaps uh, the more uh, famous part of her history was when she became MV Dulos in 1977 through to uh, 2010 she was the largest floating book exhibition in the world and in 2010, we bought her over and we renamed her Dulos Foss. Of course, without the MV because she's no longer sailing. Yeah, next please. Yeah, and you, you'll see that here we have our business and our ministry. Our ministry simply meaning uh, uh, charity, good works, yeah? So we, we are not 50% business, 50% ministry. We are 100% business. 100% ministry. We conduct business as an atypical business, but 100% of the profits we transfer to another tranche, and that 100% of the profit goes to good works, to ministry, to charity. Yes, so that's our social impact. Can we have the next one? And this uh, was the day when we actually took over the stewardship of MV Dulos. And we were very encouraged by the rainbow that appeared in the background uh, behind the ship. Can we have? Yes. And this is an artist's impression, a 3D rendering of our vessel on, aboard its very own anchor-shaped island. We decided to have an anchor-shaped island simply because an anchor and a ship just goes very well together. Yeah. And I think, if I may say so myself, it's stunning. Yeah. Yeah, next. And this is another milestone in our uh, history here. Since 2010, we were stuck in Singapore for three long years. We couldn't find a site. Eventually, uh, on 9th of September 2013, we, we actually towed this beauty, beautiful grand old lady from Singapore to Batam Shipyard and from Batam Shipyard eventually to Bintan. 
And here you see uh, uh, the ship in dry dock. This is a night scene. And this was the first time when I actually saw the, her, her keel, the, the underside of the ship, which, was, which would normally be underwater. And I tell you, it was a very moving experience to be able to see her from the bottom of her keel to the very tip of her mast. And here, this is, oh, it was such a wonderful day. On the 14th of October, 2015, we landed in Bintan. And you see, she's still floating. These, the, this was one of her last days on water. And uh, it took us seven weeks, actually, from the day she arrived to when she was completely up on land. Uh, here you see, that in the process of building to the left, you know, this is the hero in me standing on the thick wire cables that were used to pull the ship up. Yeah, And on the right, you see, uh, hallelujah, when we, uh, we, were, we completed the pull. And a few of the crew, the team, the contractors who helped in the pulling, they all gathered for a beautiful photo. And here we were already up on land uh, some months on, and this was the first time we tested uh, turning on the lights. And you can see that, you know, it is quite a sight to behold. Okay, yeah, this one is another milestone. On 20th August, just two days before she became 105 years old, we had uh, unveiling of the cornerstone ceremony. And it was officiated by Pak Franz Gunara, who is the uh, executive director of Bintan Resorts here. Yeah? And uh, that, that was a momentous day because that was the day when we actually officially unveiled this cornerstone and uh, we were ready to have her on an official trial opening. And this is just a, a photo of the cornerstone, yeah, which uh, talks about uh, her history and a little bit about our vision also, the, uh, the uh, using what has been placed in our hands to achieve what has been placed in our hearts. And this is a book that I have written and I've deliberately made it a book that can be read in one sitting. Yeah, it will be published uh, soon, I hope, uh, to coincide with our official grand opening, which has been delayed sadly because of the COVID situation, but nevertheless, when we have our uh, official opening, I guess that will be the day when we will also launch uh, the, the, this, this book of mine. It's called The Ship and I, in pursuance of the Grand Old Lady of the Seas, because this vessel is known in the maritime fraternity as the Grand Old Lady of the Seas. You go to any sailor that's worth his salt, and you say the Grand Old Lady of the Seas, they probably know what you're referring to. Uh, Medina, Roma, Francasi, MV Dulos, and now Dulos Foss. Yeah, that's about it, I guess. Is there something else, uh, Lindsay? Ah, okay, just a thank you. This is just a drone photo of our anchor ship island with the grand old lady up on top. Huh? Right, Daryl, back to you. Right, excellent. Okay, so for everyone who doesn't know my dad, that's him. Uh, he spent 18 minutes answering the first two questions. Really? Uh, don't forget that we have another 14 more questions to go. <laughs> right. But nonetheless, we hear your heart. We hear your heart. So the externalization of the internalization. At the heart of this project, actually, for those who, are, who, who, has, who have heard, it's a charity, it's a ministry, and it's a good works. So... With that in your heart and, and, and balancing it with the investment that you have put into this ship hotel, the next question is what inspired you to think of buying an old ship and turning it into a, into a hotel to fulfill this vision in your heart? I mean, if, uh, if, if people know the amount that you have invested in this project, I'm sure that there are many other ways that you could invest to raise funds for charity. But why do you choose to buy an old ship and turn it into a hotel in order to achieve this vision in your heart? Okay, that's a multifaceted question, but uh, let me just start by saying that I guess the key word is obedience, uh, obedience to a calling. Yeah, um, yeah there, there, there will be ample ways uh, we can uh, invest in many different forms uh, to achieve the, uh, a similar vision. 
but I believe that the calling uh, to me is very clear to start a true blue 100% profit oriented company. And, but I didn't start by thinking of buying a ship to become a ship hotel. Uh, we actually searched Singapore, Malaysia for any form of business, but you know, nothing came about, nothing excited us until 2010, uh, end of 2019, uh, 2009 actually, when Dulos, uh, MB Dulos sailed into Singapore and when she was put up for sale, bam, we said, yes, this is it. So we beat uh, six other contenders or five other contenders, if I'm not wrong and we managed to uh, take over the stewardship of this grand old lady, yeah? And I would say that perhaps um, it is very fitting uh, because the uniqueness, the history would go very well with our vision, yeah? And our vision is actually an age-old vision. For me, it's been 30 long years, and you know, since time immemorial, uh, people around the world have been helping the underprivileged. So I guess, yeah, it's a fulfilling of the vision. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so since you decided to enter the hospitality line, which is very much in line with SDH uh, education, uh, its programs that it offers, uh, mm -hmm. maybe you'd like to share with the viewers, what is the difference between the operation of a traditional hotel, meaning a land-based hotel, uh, as opposed to a ship hotel? I guess there's really not much difference uh, from, a, from an operational perspective. You know, you still have the typical uh, departments like housekeeping, you have the front desk, you have, of course, your engineering, you have your F&B uh, service, you have your F&B kitchen, et cetera, et cetera. You know? uh, but maybe the, the dif differentiating factor here is I think I mentioned it a little bit earlier, the ship, the lingo that our, we need to train our crew to always use, you know, as I said, we, we do not have uh, six, eight floors, eight levels, we have eight decks. So we, when we, we uh, put somebody into his or her cabin, we say, sir, ma'am, your cabin is at deck three or deck five, as the case may be and if you look out the pothole. So this, these are the little things that make it very different. And it's a bit difficult because the crew that we have in, uh, currently, they all are from the hospitality industry and they always say cabin, cabin. Hey, um, I'm, I beg your pardon. They always say room, room, room. Oh, uh, Papa, uh, Ibu, that's Mr. and Miss Madam. Uh, you are going to floor number three. Tengkat tiga. Oh gosh. And then I'll give them a, a stand. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. You're going to deck three. Yeah. And we also say port and starboard. We don't say, oh, on the left side of the corridor, that's where your room is. We say on the port side, that's where your cabin is. So these are the little things. But a little bit more specifically, our engineering team uh, is faced with a, a kind of an onerous task because they have to do a lot of steel work. This, this ship, old as it may be, is 100% steel in structure. So you don't have the brick and mortar like in most other land hotels. So there's a lot of rust management to handle. There's a lot of grinding, uh, welding, you know, whatsoever. Yeah. So these are the differences, but by and large, uh, not much difference operationally. I see. So the differences are more in terms of uh, the maintenance of the ship. And how about licensing? Is licensing a challenge uh, for a ship hotel? Oh, you, you hit the nail right on the head. Huh? Uh, simply because when she was pulled up onto land, we deregistered her. So she's no longer ship. That's why we don't have the MV, uh, which is motor vessel. Yeah. So she is, she's an ex-ship. She is still a ship at heart, but she is on land. So is she... Is she a building? Is she a plane? Is she Superman, you know, <laughs> so to speak? So the, the licensing authorities had a hard time, but eventually uh, we did manage to get her. So she is now a land-based hotel. I see. So I guess it was much easier to do so in Indonesia than in Singapore. Eh? Probably so because of the, uh, the slightly less uh, regulated uh, system there. 
And uh, one thing I must say that Bintan Resorts has been most, most helpful. I don't think we could have done it on our own without uh, their help because they have all the contacts, they, they, they have their network, you know, whereas we don't, yeah? Thanks, right. uh, Bintan Resorts, whoever is listening in. <laughs> Okay, great. Okay, moving on. Now we need to address the elephant in the house, in the room, mm. um, the COVID-19 situation. Everyone is talking about it and we know the entire hospitality industry, the travel industry is very badly hit. Uh, so the first question with regards to this topic, do you find any good things about this COVID-19 situation uh, that impact the business or, are, or is everything bad? Well, I, I don't think anything is totally bad, yeah? Uh, if you look with positive eyes and with a positive mindset, I'm sure you can find good things. And we did, we did find good things. Um, when we closed temporarily because there were no more visitors uh, being able to come in to Bintan, we still had a lot of work that was left undone. You know, we were only on a trial opening, if you remember. So we took this opportunity and we actually uh, quickly got our team together, uh, identified the projects that had to be completed and everybody worked their hearts out to get the things done. Now, at the same time, I would say that the, the team kind of gelled together, you know, there was more teamwork, there was more camaraderie, you know. So this is... Um, perhaps the social capital that we can speak of, you know. Our social capital increased by leaps and bounds. You know? It's like we had new shares being pumped into, new social capital being pumped into our company. So that, that was very, very uh, touching. It, 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 I really felt very good that everybody in our team just came together. Ah, what else do you want me to do? I don't have to just concentrate on my this. I can help this. If you need to, I'll come and do second shift. I don't mind things like that, you know. So I guess sometimes it takes a crisis to bring out the best in people. Yeah. So this, these are some of the good things. But perhaps Daryl, I mean, from um, F&B perspective, uh, I think you are, you, you are more uh, proficient in this area. Maybe you can share from, because uh, in the ship, in a hotel, F&B is very, very important. And I know uh, that you have done a lot to talk with our team to come up with proper F&B procedures, uh, menus, etc. Maybe you can share what good came out from this crisis. Well, now I become the speaker and you become the moderator. Eh? Yeah. Well, in the Singapore context, the F&B sector has also been quite badly hit, but those who managed to embrace the changes that come with the crisis are the ones that survive. Uh, not just survive, but also become better in terms of hygiene practices, as well as in terms of, of just adjusting our operations to fit into wherever the business is. So, in Indonesia, it's very different because there is no ready uh, delivery market as we had in Singapore. Uh, I guess uh, in Singapore, when, when the circuit breaker or, or the, our local equivalent of a lockdown happened, um, our restaurant in Singapore, which is Santa Fe Tex-Mex Grill, we actually went all out to do an island-wide delivery and that helped us to stay afloat. For us in Singapore as well, um, there were many restaurants who did not survive the circuit breaker or the lockdown. And once we reopened, um, with, the, with less competitors in the market, I think people are just rushing to eat out at whichever restaurants are still surviving. So that's where we picked up on whatever is available, whatever revenue, as we said, it's salvage all revenue. And that's how we managed to survive. Uh, so in Bintan, it's quite different because uh, it is very much a tourist market in the Bintan Resorts area, and there's just nobody to serve, even if your restaurants are running. So nonetheless, it's good that the staff, even as in the F and B departments, uh, manage to redeploy themselves to fit into other areas of the hotel business and preparation for reopening. Yeah, 
Hope that answers that your question. That was a somewhat modest reply, Daryl, but uh, just to uh, just a little bit more specific, Daryl actually spent some time with our crew there, and he came up with menus for the different different restaurants, different outlets. He came up with the in cabin menus, etc., and he did it such that the the dishes would be very compelling, very unique to Indonesia, very unique to a ship, and yet not too difficult to prepare so that you don't need master chefs to come up with uh, good things. And one thing I must say that very important for FMB, he actually did it such that any chef, whether you are the, the most junior or you are the head chef, you must be able to come up with the same dish at consistent quality, consistent taste. Yeah, and to add to that, maybe uh, Daryl, you mentioned that some restaurants in Singapore did not survive. Huh? Um, partly it could be because, uh, you know, they, they found the situation too taxing, but uh, it could also possibly be um, a strategic move on their part, you know. Uh, I think there's a phrase, there's a saying, you know, those who live and run away will live to fight another day, you know. So there may be times when you have to just make some very tough decisions, uh, call it a day for the moment and regroup yourself to come, come back in when, when the timing is more correct. Yeah, I guess that's about all I have to say. All right. Well, you sound quite positive about this uh, situation. Um, is that your general take of the crisis situation? Oh gosh, no, no, no. <laughs> no. Uh, no. Uh, I think I have to be... I have to be very frank, very candid in my answer to what is my general take of this crisis situation, yeah? Um, you know, the crisis is very real. It is very dangerous, yeah? Uh, not just to human lives, but to uh, the world economy. I believe the world economy has lost something to the tune of $16 trillion, you know? And, uh, that is an enormous, enormous sum. sum huh? uh, and many people are very eager to resume business. And that's, that kind of worries me, that kind of frightens me. So, you know, even in good times, huh, you know, I think there have been uh, videos circula circulating around the internet that there are lapses. There are many lapses in hotels, in restaurants, etc., even in good times. So when you have a, a pandemic such as this and you, you have lapses, gosh, you know, a second wave, a third wave might just be in the making. So I really feel that companies, when they, in their, in their, effort to try and quickly reopen and bring in whatever guests that they, we, they can receive. Uh, they should take one step back and look deeper into the situation. Are you doing it for PR and marketing purposes? You know, I, I almost am afraid to say this. I know I would draw a lot of flag from here, but because this is an, an, a, a webinar organized by uh, MBA students, uh, I think I should be very candid here with full of candor and tell it like it is. Uh. If you are doing it for PR, for marketing purposes, you must ensure that you do not have lapses. Can you ensure that? That is the critical question. If you can't, then perhaps it, is, it may be wiser to just hold back for a while let the pandemic uh, force be, be lower, yeah? From a tornado to a hurricane to a tropical storm, so to speak, yeah? Then uh, consider reopening, yeah? Now, my main point, I guess, here is to say that all of us have to think through this situation carefully and make responsible decisions with honesty. Now, when you make responsible decisions with honesty, then that becomes a stepping stone, a, a, a foundation for you to act with integrity. 
if you're honest with yourself and you're honest with your crew and you're honest with your guests, then you can take the next step and act with integrity. But if you're just too gung-ho, you might find that your efforts to reopen too soon might be, might actually be a swan song for you too. So I apologize. I, I, I guess I have to be very candid on, on, on this matter. So that's my general take, yeah? But by the same token, maybe just one last thing. I am eager to open. <laughs> I am, yeah? Well, somehow I felt that was like a rally for the elections upcoming. <laughs> that was just passed, huh? uh, maybe next elections you can run for. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I have a, a quick question from uh, Willy Ong. Okay, are, are there still domestic or international guests coming? Uh, I mean, what's the impact of COVID-19 on the operations of the Lost Force? Uh, international guests, uh, I would say there are almost none. Uh, maybe those who happened to be in Bintan at the time when the lockdowns were imposed and they had to stay there, uh, they may still be there, but they are not uh, that market, yeah? And uh, most of the international market guests from, are from Singapore, because Singapore is one of the most easiest, con convenient, most convenient way to get into Bintan. And as long as international guests cannot come to Bin Singapore, then there, there will be none coming to Bintan. Yeah? Or maybe I would say none, but precious few. And the local market in uh, Bintan, was it Willy who asked? Yeah, Willy. Uh, the uh, local market is way too small. Huh? The population in Bintan is in the region of a half a million. In an island that is two and a half times the size of Singapore. And not all of that half million people have disposable income. Yeah, and some of them might want to save it for better days ahead. Yeah, whatever they have. Yeah, so that the market is again further diminished. So it's, it's a tough decision. Yeah, but uh, hopefully, when the uh, Bintan opens its doors to other parts of Indonesia, when other parts like Jakarta, Surabaya, Bandung, wheresoever become safer, then you you find that oh there will be a, a bigger mass coming in uh, of a uh, Indonesian local market. Indonesian, uh, yes. Across Indonesia, you mean? Across Indonesia, yeah. But there are so many parts of Indonesia, I guess, which are still uh, facing this crisis uh, right. head on, yeah. Okay, so as of now, operations have basically come to a standstill whilst we are waiting for the right time to reopen. For us, yeah, 100% standstill. All right, that's good to know. Okay, now, um, we have many people tuned in today who are either in the hospitality industry or who are studying to become part of the hospitality industry. Uh, and this is a very scary time to enter this industry um, with this situation. So, would you like to share have you have asked any uh, policies or measures to help your employees during this pandemic? I mean, those who have decided to stay on, to take on different roles in the company, who have proven themselves uh, worthy of this extra effort uh, to, to support them mm. and keep their jobs during this pandemic. Wow, I see a beach party going on. <laughs> yeah, this was in the past. Yeah, um, I just maybe should put on record that I am very, very thankful to the vast majority of our crew who, who, you know, very faithfully stuck with us, yeah? And um, I guess, you know, reassurances to them at this juncture may be worth its weight in gold, yeah? far more than maybe is what we call concrete measures. But we do have concrete measures. Uh, let me explain. Um, for those who are, have been, in that sense, temporarily laid off, uh, where they, are, they, are, they have gone on leave, we have given them, we are giving them on a monthly basis uh, a living allowance. Yeah? And over and above that, we are also giving them what uh, in Indonesia is termed a sambako which is like a basic food package, which may include rice, eggs, uh, indomie noodles, uh, oil, 
and whatnot there. Yeah? So um, we know that these uh, measures will never be enough, but it's just something that we need to do and we, we, we know that even though it is not enough, the vast majority of them are very thankful and they appreciate what we do. And by the same token, we appreciate they are sticking on with us because when we reopen, surely we will need them to come back. Mm. Yeah, so we have done that. And we have also instituted some transfers. Uh, as I mentioned, I think earlier in this program that uh, there is very much less departmentalization. So we have initiated transfers. If we need somebody else in one department and some, there's uh, one too many in another department, we propose a transfer and many of them, are, a few of them rather, are, are very willing and they're so happy that they, they have an opportunity to learn a new skill, try a new career in the same hospitality industry. Yeah? Uh, just say, for example, we've, we've had a steward in the kitchen transferred to become a security guard and he loves it. Yeah, and we have uh, somebody from the F&B service transferred to the front desk and she loves it. Yeah, and we love it too. Yeah, so these are some of the uh, things. Maybe, you know, the term that's used is like social mobility, right, you know, yeah? where people can be transferred from one place, one department, one job to another. Yeah, uh, and that helps uh, a lot because we need to run a very tight ship. I hope that answers the question. Yes, it does. Uh, yeah, so we can see that those who are willing to adapt will continue to have a role and continue to have employment in the company. Thank and you, Daryl. The, 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 you, very... you, you, yeah, the word adapt is fantastic. Yes, they must, we must all be willing to adapt. Even yep. I, yeah, we, I have to adapt. Yep. And they're all heavy. very well deserving. Huh? Yes, amen. Yeah. All right. Um, so as you have done quite a lot to alleviate the worries and fears of the employees, um, the next question is, what are the specific things that you yourself worry about relating to your business? What do I worry about? Wow. <laughs> Maybe just take the top two. I don't yeah. be here till tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Short, short answer. Um, I think in Bintan, they have come up with an acronym, uh, uh, CHSP, which is Cleanliness, Health, Safety and Protocol. I think that's a marvelous acronym uh, because it, it, it addresses cleanliness, the health of the individuals, safety of everybody involved and the protocols, the new protocols that must be put in place. Yeah. So I worry that while these, uh, the, these factors, CHSP, is very relevant, very important, and must be adhered to. I worry whether we can adhere to it all the time and not some of the time, everyone and not some of the people only. You know, it's everybody, all the time, everything. That is my worry. And we must try to make that happen. Yeah. Uh, my other worry, I guess, is for the crew because you know, many of them are not just uh, supporting their families in Bintan, but they also remit money home to their loved ones in other parts of Indonesia. And in these trying times, you know, they might have to stop the uh, rem remittances. So that's again my worry. How do we try and help each other? How do we try to quickly get out of this uh, crisis situation. And I guess finally, uh, the short question, short answer is financials. Yeah, in, in every company, uh, you know, if you just think March, April, May, June, July, and we are now into August, five to six months, yeah, of zero revenue and running costs incurred every month. We have to be very, very mindful. Uh, let's not be too flippant about it. Oh, don't worry, I, I have enough. Or no, don't worry. Uh, no, no, we must, we must worry in that sense. Yeah, we must be concerned and we must take positive steps as to how we can. And I, I guess you know, um, you know, a cord of uh, three strands is difficult to be broken. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you must seek wise counsel. Yeah. 
So these are some of the things, if you don't seek wise counsel and you think, oh, no worries, I, I think I can do it, this is what I'm going to do, then I think you might face a, a, a tougher problem. So don't be afraid to seek wise counsel. Don't be afraid to say, let's gel together because a cord of three strands is difficult to break. Right. Okay. Well, that is a lot of worries indeed, and which is why <laughs> if you look at some of the older photos that we saw in the presentation, we can see uh, Eric's hairstyle has changed over the years. Huh? <laughs> yeah, a lot more hair in the earlier days. Yeah. yeah uh, well, I want to qualify <laughs> that I'm not losing hair. I'm gaining face. Yeah. <laughs> right. Specifically in the forehead. Huh? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Well, in one phrase, how will you describe your business strategy to weather this crisis? How do I describe I think my... you used the phrase before which uh, had the word dictatorship or so. Ah, okay, okay, yeah. Um, before I go to that, maybe the phrase is that interventionist corporate governance. Wow. You know? Yes, it sounds very uh, very high sounding, you know, but actually it is not, you know. When I say interventionist corporate governance, the word, the key word is intervention. You know, we need to have at this time of crisis, less laser fare management styles. We need to say, mm. this has to be done, you do it with a firm hand, but with a fair hand, yeah? And I think that's very, very crucial. So you need to intervene when you see that people are not uh, doing what they're supposed to do. Mm. Intervention in the governance of your business, yeah? The term that you probably were alluding to, Daryl, is what I term, and I like, I didn't, I didn't come up with this term, it's, it's been used, yeah? Benevolent dictatorship. Yeah, it seems like uh, two opposing views. Uh, one is a dictator, you know, and but the other one is benevolent. So what we are saying now here is that you must have that strong arm of the law, of the policies, of the of of your vision and all that. You must be very strong and and unwavering there. But at the same time, you're benevolent. You're not putting people in jeopardy. You're not putting them in difficulties. We are working together. Yeah. So benevolent dictatorship together with the interventionist kind of a governance, I think will be one way to help pull us through. Now, when we say pull up through, I guess I would say that we are, not, we are going to pull through this pandemic not in spite of it, but we're going to pull through it. You know, we're going to take advantage of the pandemic, whatever advantages that, that come with it, we're going to take, make use of that advantage to our benefit. Yeah, and I, I think I mentioned just now, uh, we are talking about that there's a gelling together, there is less uh, departmentalization, you know, all these things uh, is very, very important. Uh. And maybe I should want, I should add at this juncture that, you know, many companies uh, in such a situation have to take uh, maybe consideration of economic choices and strategic choices. Mm -hmm. Now, I've given that much thought over the last few months. Which should take precedence? Economic choices, how do we stay afloat? How do we make sure that our cash flow is strong, is, is, is enough to tide us through these times of zero uh, revenue? So these are the short-term things that we must take. And if we do not, and we try to be, wow, such a, a long-term visionist and all that, <laughs> then you find that, you know, you'll be in a tougher situation. So there may, may be economic choices that you have to make, very tough choices, and we have to do it. Yeah? But this is for the immediate term. For the slightly longer term, we have to take strategic choices. Consider the choices that we have. What can we do to, uh, to maybe cater to the new normal? Yeah? 
So these are the little things that, you know, keep me awake in the night huh? and, um, and also uh, make me talk to people, seek wise counsel. Yeah. Right. So we do see your strategy to weather this crisis revolves very much around strong leadership, decisive leadership. And I mean, we couldn't agree more with that because unless the Trump, I mean, unless a trumpet does not sound, uh, does uh, sound a clear call, people will not get ready for battle. Yes. So we need to hear Precisely. that clear call from the trumpet. Yes. Right. And I want to add yes. that perhaps the gloom of today should not be deemed as our destiny. No. Yeah, mm. we will overcome. Very good. Okay, which leads us very much into the next topic on marketing because we have exactly 10 minutes left. Gosh. Okay, moving on to marketing. Uh, we have some questions enjoy, from the huh? audience. Yeah. We have some uh, questions. Okay, from mm. I'm looking at one from Namtran. After the COVID-19, what are your specific plans to project a refreshed feeling when they book into your hotel? I like the term refreshed feeling. And I also like to highlight another question from Tommy. Uh, do you think uh, there might be changes in expectations of visitors staying at hotels post-COVID? And how would hotel adapt to these changes? Uh, expectations first, yeah. Uh, certainly, uh, expectations uh, will be different. Uh, people, I think this is a run-of-the-mill answer. Uh, people will expect that they are kept safe when they are at our place. Yeah? And we have to take steps to ensure that there, as long as uh, some of these measures are still in force, we must have our social distancing, we must wear our masks, we must san have sanitization, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Our uh, premises must be sanitized, you know, the buttons to the elevators, uh, the, the, maybe even the remote control of your air conditioning, etc., etc. Yeah, all these have to be in place to give people the assurance that when they are at your premises, they are safe. So definitely expectations will be up. But one other expectation, and I think hoteliers uh, must be mindful of, is discounts. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it, I guess it's a natural uh, re 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 request, natural expectation. Yeah, so we have to work out uh, what discounts we may have to give, and whenever we do have uh, discounts to fulfill expectations of the market, we also have to ensure that our operating costs are correspondingly uh, reduced without impacting quality of service, quality of food, high standards of management. Yeah, mm. so that, yeah, expectations. Mm. Let's make a list. Yeah? If you are in the hospitality uh, industry, make a list, stick, uh, get, have a meeting with all your, your people and review the new expectations and don't mm. whine about it. Uh, mm. Just accept it as reality. Mm. Refresh feelings, yes. Um, you know, I think um, Dulos forced the ship hotel on his very own anchor ship island uh, without having to do very much different things can actually offer refreshed feelings to people who, who, who come and stay with us. Mm. Yeah. Um, maybe I should add at this juncture, and we really don't have much time left here, but um, we have had people telling us, hey, um, Eric, your place is so isolated, yeah, uh, far from the beaten track, you know. And I say, hey, that's exactly what we like, yeah, because I differentiate isolation from desolation, yeah. Oh, okay, you can see from this figure, uh, photo, we are very isolated, we are on our own, on our very own anchor shaped island, and yet. We are just like uh, three minutes of a buggy ride from the ferry terminal that brings people from Singapore. Yeah, but we are very secluded. And maybe again, I should add at this juncture for because of the of time factor, yeah. Uh, people also tell me, Eric, won't people be bored, you know, uh, just coming to your place with really nothing to do? I say yes, but that's what we are going to market. We are going to market boredom. 
maybe that's the unique part of us. Yeah, um, I want you all to be able to come and relax. And after three days or whatever number of days in our hotel, go back home refreshed, rejuvenated, rather than going home more tired than before you went on your holiday, which is the typical uh, syndrome. Everybody is chasing to do activities and run like crazy, do anything and everything in a short span of two or three days and go back exhausted and then say, oh, I think I have to go for another holiday. <laughs> Yeah, so it's things like that. So we have convenient isolation at, at our, our place. Uh, we have revitalizing boredom. So we will market boredom, if you know what I mean. All right, yeah? very good. Does that kind of answer those two questions? Yeah, I'm sure it does. I think it, you have actually uh, driven home the point which you made in our pre-webinar preparations to get the best position for market recovery. Uh, I think you're very clear about where you understand that this is the this is what people can expect when they come and stay at Dulos Force as opposed to any other hotel uh, after the uh, after this uh, COVID-19 is mm. being managed. But having but having said that, uh, I guess I should yeah. just add that yeah, we do have activities, yeah. We we have activities for of those course, who yeah. uh, who want uh, a little bit more action, yeah. Yes, yeah, and all yeah. those can be found on the website, uh, www.dulosforce.com. Well, yeah, uh, Daryl and uh, Eric, uh, pardon me. I think there's a few more questions which have been mm. posted in the chat. So pardon maybe me. if we would like to request our participants to allow us perhaps around five, ten minutes more so that we can... I can see that Eric is really not wanting to share more here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so those of you who would like to leave the webinar, we are going to send the videos to you so that you can view and listen to the whole webinar completely. But uh, let's let's have kind of like five, 10 minutes more to just go through some okay. of the questions. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so we will not rush through the last two questions. Um, well, I have a very interesting comment actually here from Frederick Francis, uh, perhaps not boredom, but uh, provide a safe wilderness for relaxation, rejuvenation, and fellowship. Right, that can be part of your marketing uh, material in future. Oh. Yeah, I hope it's recorded. I didn't write it down. Huh? <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so thanks for to everyone who is staying with us so far. We officially have three minutes, but as uh, Fred Utana says, we will. Uh, extend for a little bit more and uh, whoever can stay, you're most welcome to join us for the last two questions. As we go towards the conclusion of this webinar, the question is, how do you feel about establishing your project in Bintan, Indonesia, and would you have considered some other location elsewhere? Well, in 2010, when we bought the uh, MV Dulas, uh, our natural tendency was to look for a site in Singapore. But for three plus years, we tried, we tried, and we were not successful. Yeah, And we had people coming to us, say, Eric, why don't you try Malaysia? Why don't you, you know, specifically like in Johor and in Penang? Uh, why don't you try Myanmar? Because Myanmar has a big growing market. Why don't you try even as far as Australia? Yeah. Um, I really didn't want to get too far out of home, so to speak. So when a friend suggested that I talk to Bintan, uh, Bintan Resorts, I jumped on the idea. And when we uh, shared with Bintan, they jumped on the idea too. Yeah. So with the benefit of hindsight, I would say that I'm extremely, extremely glad that we are in Bintan. Now, where else in the world, so to speak, can we have a place that is just uh, one hour by luxury fast ferry from Singapore. Yeah. Uh, where else in the world can we find people who are willing to let us reclaim the sea and have an anchor shaped island to boot, not just a rectangular piece of land? And one more thing where else would there be someone? who would say to us, like Pak Franz Gunara had said to me many years back, when I proposed the Anchor Shape Island and I was worried that it would cost a little bit too much, Pak Franz came to me and he said, Eric, to help you keep your capital costs down, 
we will do the reclamation for you gratis. You know, how can there be any regrets then? You know, I feel that they have not just bought into the concept, but they have bought into our vision too, on how we can do our good works and help the community at large. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm very thankful for that and absolutely so, no regrets. No regrets. So Bintan is the permanent home for Dulos Foss. Yes, permanent. And if you, and if you had to choose again, will you choose, still choose Bintan? Without a doubt. And if you bought another ship, will you still park it in Bintan? <laughs> another ship? Uh, I think your mother is going to kill me. Uh. Okay, just kidding. Uh. Please Let's don't not do answer that, that question for now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, as we, as we draw to a close, I'm going to just ask one last question that was posed by a viewer from Livio Deltin. Um, because we, we are all excited to visit the ship hotel and some of us go by ferry, which is very accessible from Tanah Merah. Uh, some of us travel domestically within Indonesia. But the question here, can the site of the hotel be approached by pleasure boats and yachts with a suitable pier and wharf for mooring? Wow, who was that who answered, asked this question? Someone called Livio Deltin. Wow, and where, where is Livio from? Uh, which country, if I may just ask? Uh, she's muted. Oh, she's muted, yeah, okay. Philippines. No worries. You know, that's oh, from an Philippines, excellent uh, okay, question. All right. All right, Fred, uh, Dr. Fred Nosa is uh, from Philippines. Oh, from the Philippines, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. You know, that is in our second or third phase plan. Yeah? We, our little anchor-shaped island is surrounded by water. And when we uh, reclaimed this island, we, we actually kind of uh, unwittingly created a little bay of sorts. Yeah? And in that bay, we actually have plans to set up what we may term as private birthing spaces. Not so much marina, because a marina would give a, a different impression, expectations. Yeah, but private birthing spaces. Where convoys of yachts can come, you know, park uh, and more uh, birth in, in our little bay and then come onto our ship, you know, enjoy a couple of days and then sail off. They do maybe island hopping, which is quite uh, common these days, you know. So really, we do have plans. And one more thing I might add is not just from a guest perspective, but when we do that, we also have plans to have houseboats, you know, parked in that marina where uh, the houseboats can actually supplement the number of cabins that we have on board uh, MB uh, Dulos Force, yeah. And also that when uh, when we have that those houseboats can be used as a training platform to train people in boat maintenance, to train people in butler, butler work, to train people in, in uh, maintenance, to train people in whatsoever related to houseboats, even engine repair, so on and so forth. And these houseboats can at certain times be taken out uh, on a little ride around the uh, area and then come back in. I think that would be fabulous for guests. Yeah, but that is has to be in the next phase of our development. Okay, yeah? excellent. Yeah, so thank you for sharing. And so in the last hour, we have learned quite a lot from Eric, my dad, about how he has managed to take his business through this COVID-19 situation, uh, minimizing damage by running a tighter ship, getting rid of anything that we do not need, uh, changing priorities and adapting, minimizing damage. He has salvaged revenue by doing as much as we can to just get as whatever income we can, whether it's a discount market, whether it's promotions, whatever. And most importantly, we can see his passion is still very much on fire to get the best position for market recovery. And that's where we are going to face the future from. So as we close this webinar, um, what are your final words that you'd like to share with the viewers today? What advice can you give to hotel owners and entrepreneurs, especially during this situation? Well, I wouldn't want to say advice because I'm uh, still wet behind the ears, but um, whatever that uh, I feel very strongly in my heart, let me just uh, share as a closing statement. Yeah? Um, 
I've written down something here that great faith is born in the battlefield of life. Sometimes when you, your very existence is being threatened, and I think many of us are in that kind of a situation. And this is where your faith must be strong. Keep up the faith. Don't lose heart. Yeah? There will be ups and downs in, in, in life, you know? Yeah? Uh, stick to your vision. You know, the externalization of the internalization, the uh, using what has been placed in our hands to achieve what has been placed in our hearts. No, the internalization is what impels you from within. And what impels you from within, I think, will compel you to a, a series of actions that will keep you afloat. So the, the impelling and the compelling must be given due consideration. I really feel strongly about that. It is really uh, another way of saying the externalization of the internalization, yeah? And um, maybe as a parting shot, I would want to say that at this time uh, of difficulties, uh, the CEO's vision, the CEO's priorities must take top position, yeah? Do not be swayed by other people saying, oh, this and that. Uh, you stay true to your vision, you stay true to your mission, make tough decisions, make sure you stay afloat, make sure you do everything with honesty and with integrity, and I, I, um, I can say that then you will have a much less difficult time. Yeah? In life, there'll be mountains you will climb, and shades that you seek to rest your weary bones, yeah? There'll be long and winding roads to tread, full of bumps, crevices, and cobblestones. After miles of trotting on through sleet and rain, after years of torment, suffering, and pain, often retracing your steps without much gain, going on that old familiar route again. And just when you think you're finally there, another mountain looms ahead of you but keep everlastingly at it, my weary friend, for soon the sun will shine above the morning dew. The rainbow will cast its hues upon your life with clouds of white and everything nice. No, my friend, don't think of it as burdens of life, but think of it as rewards of life. I hope that inspires all of you. Thank you. Great. Thank you for sharing and thank you everyone for joining us on this webinar. Over to you, Lindsay. Yes. Thank you so much, Mr. Eric and Mr. Dara for spending time with us and providing valuable information. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Please take five minutes to complete our quick survey. We are going to have another meeting with Mr. Darrow and his restaurant. So we hope to see you again in the future. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you.